from Hollywood, I'm Martin Grove, welcoming you to our Screen Dollars podcast, Box Office Autopsy. Right now, we'll look at the movie marketplace and analyze how things are going and where they're going sharing some opinions from my perspective after decades of talking about Hollywood on CNN Entertainment Tonight and as a Hollywood Reporter columnist. Ticket sales continued their fall stall over the post-Labor Day weekend as two low-profile wide openings hit theaters. Moviegoers could choose between 20th Century's R-rated horror thriller Barbarian or Variance Films' R-rated action drama Medieval or staying home to stream Disney's PG adventure Pinocchio from Back to the Future director Robert Zemeckis, starring Tom Hanks as Geppetto on Disney+. Plus. The truth is that with no new family product in the marketplace, this brand name Pinocchio reimagination would have been a great way for Disney to attract families and give theaters a box office boost. On today's box office autopsy, we'll see how Barbarian did at the box office gates. We'll focus on Pinocchio skipping theaters to stream instead. And we'll talk about Amazon Prime Video's upcoming horror comedy, My Best Friend's Exorcism. Later, in our Oscar Outlook Spotlight... We'll look at the Venice Film Festival, where the Banshees of Inisherin just won for Best Screenplay, Martin McDonough, and for Best Actor, Colin Farrell. And where Don't Worry Darling was the talk of the town, but for the wrong reasons. Let's start today with Barbarian, which finished first because somebody has to be first no matter how bad a weekend it is. Here's a scene that might make you think more than twice about ever doing a house rental. Yeah? I'm sorry, who are you? What? Who are you? This is 476 Barbary, right? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I think so. You don't know? No. I don't live here. I'm renting this place. It's the middle of the night. I don't have it on top of my head, the address. No, I, I'm renting this place. What? Are you, are you sure you have the right place? Yeah, I booked it like a month ago. This is unbelievable. What am I supposed to do? I don't know. I don't know. Why don't you... Why don't you come inside, and we'll call these idiots. Barbarian, Hollywood's latest horror hopeful, was tracking poorly for first choice, with all demos well below norm. Nonetheless, it overperformed, opening to $10 million at 2,340 theaters. Exhibitors were projecting 5 to $7 million, while media pundits were thinking 6 to 8 The only bright spot is that critics love it, with 92% on Rotten Tomatoes. Audiences, however, are a blah 75%. What likely helped is that it stars Bill Skarsgård, who's well-known to horror fans from playing the evil clown Pennywise in It and It Chapter 2. The storyline here follows a young woman, Georgina Campbell, who arrives late one rainy night at her rented Airbnb house to find a strange young man, Skarsgård, already there. Against her better judgment, she decides to stay over anyway. 
And that may not make much sense, but if she didn't stay, there wouldn't be a movie for us to talk about. Second place went to Disney and Fox Star Studios' Brahmastra Part 1 Shiva, with 4.4 million at 810 theaters. The Indian action-adventure fantasy flew in under the radar with no tracking. Comscore's Paul der Garabedian noted, quote, This represents the fourth best Bollywood opening in industry history domestically. 30% of box office came from IMAX, and overall 45% of box office came from 3D engagements, unquote. Critics are a low 63% on Rotten Tomatoes, and audiences are a soft 68%. Medieval did much worse, opening 15th to $810,000 at 1,311 theaters. Its first choice tracking was below norm for all demos, with under 25 women showing absolutely no intent to see it. Critics hate it, with 41% on Rotten Tomatoes, and audiences are a grim 63%. Hollywood handicappers were thinking one million or less, which is what they got, for this historical tale about an iconic 15th century Czech warlord famous for defeating armies of the Teutonic Order and the Holy Roman Empire. With openings like these, this weekend was the year's second lowest weekend to date. The overall marketplace per com score was 42.3 million, down 25.5% from the prior weekend, and down 61.8% from the comparable weekend in 2021. What this weekend needed was a movie people wanted to see, and at one point there was one, Warner Brothers and New Line's horror thriller Salem's Lot, based on the Stephen King bestseller. Lot had a lot going for it. Its director, Gary Doberman, directed the horror hits It, The Nun, and Annabelle Comes Home. Earlier this year, Lot was set to open September 9th. Then it got bumped to next April 21st. Now that slot's gone to Warner Brothers and New Line's horror thriller Evil Dead Rise. And Lot's undated for 2023 release. The film that could but didn't move into theaters this weekend is Pinocchio, which is streaming now on Disney+. Plus. We'll talk about it after this quick scene to see if it's going on your must-see list. <sighs> Locked solid. Well, no, I guess this isn't what you signed up for when you decided to be a famous actor, is it? It's not my fault. I never wanted to be famous. Sorry, kiddo. That's not the way I remember it. But I didn't want to be famous. I wanted to go to school. Hey! It's true. All of those people cheering and applauding. I hated it. <gasps> What's happening, Jiminy? Looks like some sort of fairy magic. Kind of on the nose, if you ask me. But the point is, a lie can really change a person, Pinocchio. Which is why I'm telling you the 110% most honestly honest, truthiest truthiness ever. Believe me! Oops, okay, that last part wasn't true. But everything I said up until then was. Jiminy, you okay? More or less. Now quit telling those whoppers! With no end in sight to the studio's box office drought, it's no surprise that Wall Street analysts are grumbling again about Exhibition's future. Given the street's affection for streaming, a technology play that could pay off handsomely for investors, lower ticket sales are being used to bet against Exhibition's future. Comscore's official box office total for the summer period starting Friday, May 6th and ending Monday, September 5th, Labor Day, is $3.34 billion. 
Summer typically accounts for 40% of the year's box office, which means we're probably looking at about $8.4 billion for 2022. This summer, per Comscore, studios only open 22 wide releases, meaning on 2,000 or more screens. But in the summer of 2019, there were 42 wide openings. Perhaps the only good news in Comscore's summer tally is that this summer's 22 wide domestic releases averaged $155.9 million versus $103.5 million in 2019 for each of 42 wide movies. Of course, it would help to have a few films opening right now that people want to see. Actually, we missed out on one high-profile movie this weekend because it was only available streaming. Disney Plus subscribers and their kids were able to see the new PG live-action CGI movie Pinocchio from Robert Zemeckis, who directed Back to the Future, and starring Tom Hanks as the woodcarver Geppetto. The sad truth is, Pinocchio would have kept the multiplexes busy. With no big new family films in the late summer marketplace, this brand name children's tale would have brought families to theaters and given exhibitors a badly needed box office boost. It doesn't matter that critics hate it with 30% on Rotten Tomatoes and audiences are a weak 41%. With a great Disney marketing campaign, parents would have taken their kids to see Hanks and Zemeckis' new movie. In any case, Pinocchio will be back this holiday season. Not this film, but a darker animated version from Guillermo del Toro, who directed The Shape of Water, with voice stars like Kate Blanchett and John Turturro. But this Pinocchio won't be brightening moviegoers' holiday season unless they subscribe to Netflix, where it starts streaming December 9th. Meanwhile, there's finally a film on the theatrical horizon that's not a horror film. Next weekend, we'll see Sony and TriStar's PG-13 awards contender The Woman King in theaters. It's encouraging that woman's looking good, on the tracking. All of its first choice demos are equal to or over norm. Its top demo is older women who are eight points over norm. Younger women are three points over norm. Older men are two points over norm. Only younger men don't care. They're one point under norm. Oscar winner Viola Davis stars as the leader of an all-female African warrior's army fighting an enemy out to destroy their way of life. Davis won the Supporting Actress Oscar in 2017 for her performance in Fences opposite Denzel Washington. Here's a look at the rigorous physical training the cast had to survive. My body went through hell. <laughs> oh, the training. It's been a lot. <laughs> I was like, I don't know if I'm going to survive <laughs> this process. People think training's going to be you just getting a little bit strong to do a bit of stunts. But for this... Three hours of martial arts a day. We had weapons training. Everything from sword play, spears, machetes. A lot of punching. An hour and a half of weights, sprinting. Gina, the director, joined us and that helped bond us. She's transformed our bodies, she's transformed our minds. Well, I mean, I feel like a badass. It's too early for critic scores on RT, but the buzz is that Woman, opening September 16th, has solid box office and awards prospects, especially for Davis. If you're tired of seeing horror films in theaters, but don't mind watching them alone at home in the dark, 
there's a horror comedy awaiting you starting September 30th on Amazon Prime Video. It's My Best Friend's Exorcism, a story set in 1988 about two high school sophomores, best friends Abby and Gretchen. When Gretchen starts acting strangely, Abby investigates. And then the big question is, will their friendship be strong enough to beat the devil? Here's a quick look to help you decide if you want to see it or skip it. you're moving this summer. We're always going to be friends. Pick you up in town. It's going to be hot this weekend. Should we do something? I think we're alone now. Hit the beating of our hearts is the only sound. Who's over there? This weird little building where that girl was sacrificed in a satanic ritual. Let's go in. Come on, Abs. One more adventure? sick physically she got a little grotesque and gnarly but then she got better right she looks copacetic but up here you can cuckoo for cocoa pops i guess that's one way to put it dollars of donuts it's demonic possession she needs an exorcism what was that We got ourselves a demon! Please help! Woo! I think we're alone now. Oh my god! This is the cost! There doesn't seem to be anyone around. Time now to fire up our Oscar Outlook Spotlight and see what's happening on the awards front. The 79th Annual Venice Film Festival is winding up this weekend after giving a glitzy boost to some high-profile Oscar hopefuls. What happens on the Lido doesn't stay on the Lido, which is why studios with an eye on Oscar's Best Picture Race love Venice, the world's oldest film festival. Audience reactions at Venice get global media coverage, positioning them for Academy members' early interest. Last week saw a standing ovation for 13 or 15 minutes, depending whose stopwatch you trust, for Searchlight's The Banshees of Inisherin, which now seems on its way to a Best Picture nom. Banshees takes place on a remote island off the west coast of Ireland where two lifelong friends, played by Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson, are unexpectedly at odds when one suddenly ends their friendship. Martin McDonough, who wrote and directed Banshees, is no stranger to Venice. He was there in 2017 with three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri, a Golden Lion nominee that won for screenplay, and then got seven Oscar nods with two wins. Farrell and Gleason were both on hand for the Banshees' applause, which was said to be the festival's longest. The crowd was so carried away it actually delayed the start of the next screening for Warner Brothers and New Line's Don't Worry Darling, which has also been making headlines, but the wrong kind. Darling seems to be a real-life case of She Said, She Said, pitting director and star Olivia Wilde and her co-star Florence Pugh against one another after personal conflicts during production opposite Harry Styles. Darling's standing ovation ran seven minutes, but news reports noted there was no eye contact between Pugh and Wilde as the audience went wild. 
Controversy can help films at the box office, but it usually doesn't help them win awards. Critics can help, but the early critics' score on Rotten Tomatoes is a rotten 43%. And London's Daily Mail Online said of the early European reviews that, quote, the majority of them have been negative, unquote. Adding, however, that Pew was being singled out for what's being called her superb performance. And that certainly could translate into lead acting noms. That's it for today's box office autopsy, but we'll return next week to see if the Woman King conquers the box office. And in our Oscar Outlook Spotlight, we'll see who's getting into the early awards conversation. So please join us again then, and thanks very much for listening. Time now for our film flashback look at what was happening in Hollywood right around now, way back then. Let's set today's time travel dial for September 10th, 2011. Cliff Robertson won the Best Actor Oscar in 1969 and was in some 60 movies before his death September 10th, 2011 at 88 but he's best remembered for Hollywood work he didn't do. Robertson was an innocent victim at the center of a Hollywood embezzlement story. The starring role was played by Columbia Pictures president David Beagleman, who was later convicted of forgery and theft. It's the kind of intricate story people say you'd need to write a book to tell it all. Fortunately, that book exists. David McClintock's Indecent Exposure, published by Morrow in 1982. McClintock originally broke and covered the Beagleman story for the Wall Street Journal. Hitting the highlights is what's possible here, but McClintock's 544-page book is where all the amazing details can be found. Beagleman's career began to unravel in February 1977 when Robertson received an IRS Form 1099 for $10,000 from Columbia for work done in 76. But Robertson hadn't done anything for Columbia then. He had his secretary contact the studio's accounting department to find out more. Before long, Columbia knew the 1099 was no error. A check cut in Robertson's name had been endorsed and cashed, but it wasn't Robertson's signature. Senior executives quickly noticed the handwriting looked just like Beagleman's. When they finally approached him, Beagleman said he recalled ordering that check and would look into it. The first thing he did was try to reach Robertson by phone. They were no strangers, since during Beagleman's super agent days, he'd represented Robertson. Their relationship ended badly when Robertson decided Beagleman had lied to him about money and the terms for a movie deal. From here, the plot thickens. Columbia put Beagleman on paid holiday. Further investigation found he'd embezzled $65,000 more, also by forging checks. The issue of whether Beagleman, president since 1973, could remain, drove a wedge between Columbia CEO Alan Hirschfield, who favored firing him, and the board, which wanted to keep the very well-connected executive. Columbia wound up ousting Hirschfield for not reinstating Beagleman, who Columbia later let go, explaining he suffered from emotional problems. Indeed, the deeply troubled Beagleman ultimately committed suicide in 1995 at 73. 
But in 1978, Beagleman was fined $5,000 and sentenced to three years probation with community service, for which he produced a well-regarded anti-drug documentary. In January 1980, Beagleman became president of MGM. The following year, Hirschfield was named chairman of 20th Century Fox. Robertson claimed to have paid the greater price, being blacklisted in Hollywood for years for exposing the very popular Beagleman's crimes. That's it for today's podcast. Thanks for listening. We'll be back with another box office autopsy next week. In Hollywood for Screen Dollars, I'm Martin Grove. <laughs>